10 to 15 of the companies that received the highest ranking from our anchor partners of the energy program. And uh, just by the way of introduction, first of all, a few other announcements I wanted to make, um, and, and really apologies to those who travel far distances, but with the state of uh, health concerns, we actually had to uh, turn some of our upcoming events into virtual. So for those of you who came here for our IoT mobility uh, selection days that are happening tomorrow and the day after, we actually canceled those and we're gonna have virtual presentations. So the partners can still view the startup pitches uh, over the links that they will receive. However, there won't be bigger gatherings like this the following, after the following days. Uh, I do also mention that there was a couple of dinners tomorrow night as well as uh, Wednesday night. Those two are also canceled. We also had a, an off-site uh, meeting with our anchor partners on, on Thursday. That event has also been canceled, similar to all these other events that you're seeing with the concern and fear of coronavirus. Uh, so apologies for those of you who are here. Obviously, our, your safety and health is our top priority. And we hope that today uh, is engaging. Uh, actually, our energy practice is one of the very few ones that still has this meeting going. I'm happy that you guys have made it here. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, we have 20 plus companies that are presenting today. Uh, you have received the information to log into the playbook system if you're an anchor partner of energy practice and vote on those startups that are presenting. Uh, if you are just using the app, you will have more granular details about uh, each company, the amount of money they raised, their funding stage, and uh, the, the traction that they've uh, received er in early days. So, um, so with that said, I will give you a quick rundown of our 2019, and then I'll, I wanted to, uh, perhaps for the introduction purposes, have our partners to say a few words to those startups that are here in the room uh, so that they better understand what is demographic of our partners. So very quickly, um, in 2019, the we entered five new countries. We opened up 11 new locations for plug and play and launched 18 different programs. The locations today are now 30 plus around the world. And the number of events only in 2019 surpassed 52% uh, were in Silicon Valley, 26% in Asia and 22% in Europe. Uh, 720 events, some were public events and some private. Most of these events are for startups to go on stage and pitch and receive feedback. We have quarterly major summits. That is the graduation of the companies that enter the program. So there will be another kind of uh, event where the companies get a larger stage and more uh, partners in the audience that they will pitch. Our events for the Energy Expo will be in June. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard the news, we, we, made, we launched our joint venture with the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. About 40 of the major petrochemical companies that have pledged to put an end into plastic waste, we now are acting as the technology platform. And we have uh, an office in Paris, one in, in uh, Singapore, and one here in, si in Silicon Valley that helps these companies to find more innovative uh, startups to commercial, commercial some of their solutions. The number of startups accelerated for last year was 1,400. Basically, these are the companies who get an opportunity to come on stage, go into the programs, meet with the partners, as well as startups and, and investors in our community, and get an, a chance to attend our expo. And that's how we define the acceleration in, in our program. The number of private deal review sessions last year surpassed 1,800. These are private meetings behind the closed doors with each and every single partner that we have in our ecosystem and a list of uh, companies that they have selected to meet with prior to their visit, depending on who is participating from those groups. Number of our corporate partners uh, passed 400 last year. Uh, as I mentioned, four major summits where we announced the most innovative corporate partners 
in our energy practice, we had Tokyo Gas as the winner of our, our, our spring summit, and we had Energy Steinmark as the winner of the energy practice in fall of 2019. And again, the, the criteria to select these corporate partners as the winners are the based on the number of engagements that they've had with the startups, number of investments they made, number of proof of concepts and, and pilot projects that they've launched with the startups. So we kind of uh, review their performance and we award them uh, the certificates that uh, shows their participation in our program. And those are some of the other industry verticals and some of the other more innovative partners. So for the startups in the room, if you're targeting other sectors, you can see who are the most active corporations that you can target to work with. Uh, Milad, our venture associate, today gave uh, an update of our investment practice. For those of you who participated, I'll just run some of the numbers for those of you who weren't uh, able to to get those updates. Our average ticket size last year was uh, $114,000. We made 250 investments. About 137 investments was here in our Silicon Valley office and the rest was in Europe and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, we deployed $30 million a year in the past three years in the startups. 60% uh, of our investments in the US, the rest international. 75% of our investments target early stage companies, seed stage. As you can imagine, the size of uh, the checks are smaller. And uh, our companies in portfolio have exited uh, year by year. As you can see in 2019, 14 exits, which is unheard of in, in our venture world. Ob obviously, we take very small shares, so up to 5%. So we're not acting as, a, as an active board member in those startups, but we see a large number of exits year by year, and that's how we make most of our money in our, in our plug and play business model. These are the four big exits. The companies raised a total of $1.9 billion in 2019. All right, uh, so as I mentioned, every cohort, the focus areas of the practice is defined by the group of anchor partners that are participating, participating today. This is a quick snapshot of the breakdown of uh, technology areas for our batch five. Uh, obviously, uh, you can see a presence of uh, mobility startups at the, tr the intersection of the transportation and energy space. You see companies in the renewable energy space, asset management for companies that can bring incremental value to the business today, uh, as well as uh, carbon capture and some of the more sustainability focused startups that presented in our previous cohort. Today, the companies that are presenting, I, as I mentioned, 20 plus, some weren't able to come in uh, as we understand why, but uh, we see a number of companies in energy storage space, asset management, uh, EV, energy analytics, energy management, industrial operations, urban systems, and wireless technologies. So the purpose of uh, this event today is for our anchor partners to actually engage in the conversation with the startups. So we encourage you to ask questions that can help other partners you know, make a, a smarter decision as to whether we should vote for these companies to get in or not. So this is more of an interactive session. Uh, this front row is still empty, so if you'd like to come over and sit on the front row and engage in the conversation easier, please feel free to do so. Um, those in the back. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you so much again. Uh, after the startup presentation, uh, we have uh, networking time from three to five. We still have our networking happening today. Uh, we may afterward grab, grab dinner for those of you who are still around. Um, but I wanted to thank all the entrepreneurs um, on that side for making the trek here and best of luck today for your presentation. Uh, there, there's apps that you can put your votes in and, and comments and feedbacks. Uh, so we look forward to hearing each and every one of yours um, ideas about these companies that are here. Without any questions? From the startups, who is here for the first time? Everyone almost? Okay, I hope that you get a bit of feel for what this program has to offer for our partners who is here for the first time? Not too many? 
All right. Okay, so again, the, for those of you who is here who are here for the first time, ha haven't had this experience before, uh, feel free to ask us how to better engage in this model. But I want to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Milad, who's going to MC uh, the startup presentation. So please, a round of applause for all of our startups. Also another great part, uh, partner and colleague of mine here, Noreen in the Ventures team. I'm not just randomly coming up here. I'm emceeing, not Malad. Usually it's Malad, but um, I will take that from you, yes. Hi, um, my name's Noreen. I work with Malad and Alberto on the Ventures team, so nice to meet all of you. Um, I'll be your MC, and thank you for all coming out here, and hopefully, you know, one or none of us have the virus. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna start with our first startup, Birdstock. And this is Bill Liu. Hello, everybody. We're Burstop, and we're a company that automates uh, aerial data monitoring for industrial assets. Um, we offer a piece of technology that can remotely inspect faraway assets without a single human being on the field. And we enable this by permanently field deploying uh, remote docking systems that can accommodate any off-the-shelf drone technology. My name is Bill Liu, I'm the head of business development, and prior to joining Burstop, my experience lay in upstream EMP, where projects has taken me to live and work from West Africa to Texas, and in my experience, Data inspection, uh, no, asset inspection, the data that comes with it is pretty crucial at almost every stage um, of the oil and gas value chain, whether that is to uh, secure the integrity of our assets and more importantly, to secure the safety of our personnel. So with that said, currently $37 billion a year is being spent on collecting that data, whether that's installing, uh, inspecting a pad, whether that's a pipeline or a refinery among which $8 billion alone every year is spent on personnel movement. That's you know, getting EHS and rustabouts in and out of these very remote locations. And thanks to the advantages conferred by drone technology, a lot of this uh, old ways, the hazards uh, of uh, helicopters and ladders and scaffolding has actually been alleviated, uh, which explains why uh, drones are currently uh, growing in this sector at a 60% per annum. Um, well, with that said, uh, drones are you know, now being deployed in key inspections, such as uh, inspecting for thermal or gas signatures, uh, inspecting for leaks or cracks or faults, and also securing the perimeter uh, of assets. Growing as the use of drones may be, uh, in my opinion, that drones are still being used as a piece of new technology to treat an old and inefficient problem in inspection. That problem mainly resides in the fact that humans still needs to be on field. And with humans being on field, that means still dispatches of crews and accommodating assets uh, to shut down in order to have them uh, be there. Uh, it also means that uh, you know one needs to account for weather and the weather openings, and sometimes that results in delays. And all of the HS and E and compliance worries that goes along with uh, putting crews on the ground. And in our opinion, the, the true potential of aerial asset inspection is in completely automating it, in removing the human element from play as much as possible uh, so that we can perform the work efficiently and have data that's so constant that it's not only being treated as something that we react to, but we can actually use it proactively all the time, always turned on. So uh, at first stop, we don't only want to make the current status quo of the scope of the work more efficient, but in addition, we want to reinvent what it means to actually have your asset be monitored. Because the old scope of inspection means that people are periodically scheduling an appointment, going in and getting a snapshot of the stage of the asset in its performance, you know, a photograph, a place in time, whereas in we think that's not the full potential of data, and that's not the full potential of inspection. We think that um, through automating the entire process, we can actually get data constantly, on demand, continuously, and a scale that has never been seen before. Uh, with our technology, we want to be able to deliver 
something that's on the big data scale uh, of data collection, using uh, not only to react as a period in time, but to use this data to continuously improve upon even the future behavior of assets. And we want to do so um, you know, while having this big data capability, but also easy to access. You know, one can access this on one smartphone. And unlike our rivals who currently insist that you use their latest proprietary drones and sensors, at first stop, we want to try to be future-proof, meaning that we're currently compatible with all the vertical's latest hardware and software technology. And on top of that, first stop is a modular system, meaning that you can easily integrate it into your, ex your existing workflow. And on top of that, even easier to use. <laughs> you can access your data and insights from an app uh, from an app in your bed as easy as uh, ordering some DoorDash and, uh, you know, uh, me walking into uh, today's conference with the turnout and seeing the traffic today, maybe working from home is, you know, the current uh, workflow that's, uh, that's prevalent. And lastly, uh, with the traction that we have garnered uh, from our industrial automation grant received last year along with our pilot partnership programs, uh, along with the current multi-year contract, that's being deployed in the first quarter of this year. Our plan is to go into full commercialization by the second half of this year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. That was great um, to start us all off with. So the next startup will be ABRL from uh, Grant from ABRL. Uh, so please, everyone, let's give them a warm welcome. Awesome. Can you guys hear me okay? Cool. Hello, everyone. My name is Grant Sportelli, ABRL. I'm actually the product strategy lead. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the intelligent automation space and how we've moved from the leading AI NLP provider for enterprise use to intelligent automation. A little bit about the company before we start. Um, our tech started development in 2012 out of Cornell. We were building NLP for data capture instead of search. Um, and that built us another uh, unique model to actually use. And I'll walk you guys through how we started using that for automation other than just data capture. Today, we're working across nine different industries, including the energy space, with the number ones or number twos in each of those industries. Give you a quick example about how we started. There we go. I'm going to show you an API or an example from one of our retail customers based in the US. Uh, for preventative maintenance inspection. So this is for their fleet assets to show how we started mapping business logic in NLP. The brakes look fine, but the windows are very dirty. The oil pressure is low, the suspension looks good, and the rear left reflector is cracked. Awesome. So if you look down the center, you'll see brakes, fluid level, oil pressure, etc. That's all structured data sitting in your database. Analytics the brake connection's to good. Doors need to be... Can you stop that? Thank you. Thank you. So... All of that, can you go back actually to the previous piece? So that structured data sitting in your database was trying to be used for your analytics for teams watching. to move to, from a preventative maintenance model to a predict predictive maintenance model. That blue text to the side, though it's gone now, um, was that unstructured metadata that we were actually capturing from that technician's natural language, tagging it to the structured data and sending that to the database for machine learning. Again, to move from that pre preventative maintenance model to predictive maintenance model. Now, our thesis with the values with NLP was going to be in data capture. And what we found that that wasn't quite correct. The value is what in the NLP actually enabled. So we were mapping in business logic to as soon as we see that that rear left reflector is cracked, we're actually opening up the work order in WMS, populating that work order, ordering the part, updating the parts database for replenishment, and then notifying the manager or the technician to actually schedule the work as soon as that part's replaced. Now, where this company was using our tech for a multi-hundred million dollar cost reduction, was that we were actually able to auto bill against open warranty claims for a leased fleet using that unstructured metadata as Y data. Now we were actually able to take this much further when we started working with a Japanese OEM. You see, they had a pretty ubiquitous problem where they had a lot of unique tribal knowledge for their subject matter experts that they would use to diagnose assets. And that knowledge wasn't captured anymore. And they were all about to retire and walk out the door with it. Let me show you how we were deploying to capture that. The engine does not start when turning the key. If the battery level is full, then check the starter. If the battery has spark, then check the fuel Great. system. So this looks like we're taking natural language and just building out a flowchart. This is just a rendering for the user. What's actually happening as this is being constructed 
is our AI is concurrently writing the code for this business logic. This is an example for JSON, and we're actually using this for automation. Our AI can also write in Neo4j or Cypher if you're moving to a graph database, or R or SQL if you want to run queries. And what we have here is we have a way to basically deploy a no-code platform to build rules engines using decisions trees. Now, rules engines are really powerful. Decision trees are very powerful, especially as a bedrock for automation. They get even more powerful when you can start connecting different decision trees together in the same no-code platform. We have individuals who have never before sent an email in their life writing code to automate their job because they want to actually retire. And we can actually connect this business logic into a series of trees to automate end-to-end -end processes. Now what's important is where we can deploy this. So we deploy this in four major categories. You already kind of saw an example for digitized knowledge being used for a walkthrough. We can also use this for a no-code chatbot. We're using this as a complex decision support engine or it's a support tool for RPA to actually classify data and then make decisions on behalf of that bot. And so now your bot can grab, it, grab information, classify it, and move it to the right place based on the informa underlying information. We're automating entire workflows like you saw for that international retailer end to end so that individuals only have to map and make a decision one time, eliminating a lot of that swivel chair work. And then finally, what I'm personally most excited about, we're actually using these for data classification. So making transformations, deep outlier analysis. We have companies using this for competitive intelligence, mapping that decision tree, those rules engines with the NLP. And finally, we've begun using this for a time series analysis, so predicting where capacity is for different scheduling. I'm gonna skip ahead just because we only have a couple, or I'm over time already. We actually have 17 use cases in the energy industry. Like I said before, we've been doing a lot of work in the energy services and commodities. You can go ahead and take a picture, you'll have the slide later. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out or find me. My name is Grant Spartelli. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much for that um, presentation. And I guess the, the timer is great, but you're the only one that can see it. So if you didn't admit it, none of us would know. Um, all right, the next startup is gonna be Jorge from Gila Technologies. So thank you so much. Put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to, to plug and play. Very excited to be to be here presenting about Hela. So in Hela, we work in the space of microgrids and distributed energy resources. We're aggregating distributed energy resources to make them work in a coordinated manner so that uh, they can be much more efficient and work better to help the, util the, the grid as we know it, and also to redefine the grid, right? Because we're moving towards a more renewable energy-centric um, infrastructure system. So the solution that we propose, and this is out of uh, my PhD at MIT, was creating a decentralized ma manner to control and coordinate distributed energy resources into microgrids and other types of systems like virtual power plants. Uh, our product, uh, which you can see there, that is called the Hala Edge, is a hardware software uh, solution that you can install in front of uh, every DER in a system, every distributed energy resource, be it uh, batteries, solar, um, we also have worked with hydrogen, uh, load control, et cetera. Uh, and it does three very important things for these systems. One is that it standardizes the system for, for whoever is controlling it or, or using it. So it's very easy to just deploy new things because they are homogeneous, right? We are compatible with a lot of protocols that utility like, uh, but that equipment is usually not compatible with. We also encapsulate complexity because we have our, our software uh, has some algorithms to to make to make these uh, systems look very simple, right? So instead of having to control millions of batteries and solar panels and loads across the system, you can just talk to the fleet, and the fleet would react to it. Um, and we also simplify the the we make these systems organic, right? So we simplify how they can be uh, increased or reduced in size. So we have customers that are utilities that say, well, I want to first deploy certain number of uh, batteries in neighborhood, for example, and we want to grow it over time. So our system makes it very simple for them to, to say, oh, well, we deploy 10 batteries, it's like a, uh, it looks like a medium-sized battery, but if we add more batteries over time, it looks like a much bigger battery now. And they don't have to worry about the details and the individual elements. Uh, so this organic way of growing systems and changing them as, as technology evolves is very important for, for our customers. 
And uh, as you aggregate them in, into systems, they, they get very interesting UIs and, and very simple ways to interact uh, with these uh, elements. This is one example of one of the projects we have that is up and running in California, actually. I'll talk about the projects in, in a minute. Um, and you can see, you know, the dashboards are very simple for the for the or customers to use. The advantages of our technology uh, come in a lot of different flavors. In California, for example, a lot of them have uh, a lot of our customers have been very focused on resiliency. Um, I don't know who is, who is from California, but uh, there were some very long-term blackouts in North, well, in all California uh, during the fall, and we are expecting them this year as well. So a lot of our customers are putting batteries in houses and we're w they're trying to find a way how to make them look like bigger batteries. As so if the, if the blackout only lasts for 10 days, you still have 255 days where you want to use those resources and not just for them to be sitting there. Um, our utilities customers also like other you know, technical advantages like power factor correction, um, peak shaving, and uh, grid over supply. So when you're producing too much solar in the, during the day, uh, and you are going to have this dog corp effect, uh, you can use the battery that you have deployed for resiliency. We have done three, uh, four important projects, one in California, uh, all in the US, but one in California, one in Colorado with a utility that's called Holy Cross Energy. 20 homes with battery and solar, we're aggregating them. Uh, one in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, in Southern Air Force Base, also residential, and one with American Electric Power in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. The one in California, we have actually two with this customer. Uh, there are wineries, so they want to have resiliency. Uh, all these projects have been uh, very successful. They're up and running and uh, very scalable. So now we're talking with our utility companies, uh, customers, so that we can grow them and have hundreds, thousands of homes aggregated behind the control system. We have, you know, provided resiliency that our customers were looking for. In 2017, 18, and 19, there were blackouts in the wineries in California that are customers, and we kept them operational for as long as they needed. It's, they are completely off the grid. The company started in MIT. This is an MIT spin-off. Uh, we are completely bootstrapped, so we haven't raised any money. They're just customers, paying customers that we have. And we have about $2.5 million in revenue so far, uh, over three years, 1.5 last year. And uh, we that allow us to have a team of about 11 engineers working on this. We're planning to get our first round uh, in the next few months. So thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Okay, um, we're gonna have Sven from LiveEO next, but really quick, I wanted to, I think someone during the Anchor Roundtable asked where we see some t uh, some startups going in terms of new technologies, um, like as we pick this batch, and something that we did see was, well, a lot of startups that are combating in California, especially the natural weather disasters that we're having. So for example, the you know blackouts that we've been having. So just thought I'd bring that up. But anyway, thank you so much, and put your harm our hands together for Sven from LiveEO. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sven. Um, your pipelines and electricity grids are the backbone of our modern industrial society. They power our homes and industries. But not only because they are so extremely important for our day-to-day -day life, but also because damages of these infrastructure grids can result in extremely catastrophic events, these infrastructure grids are maintained and monitored on a high-frequent basis. These results of damages can be, on the one hand side, wildfires when vegetation grows too close to overhead lines, or on the other side, pipeline damages or pipeline explosions when stress in the ground or third-party interactions lead to uh, leakages. So, to prevent these things from happening, utilities like you take measures, do inspections on a regular basis, but these inspections are still currently conducted the same way they have been conducted 50 years ago. People walk alongside these networks, they take cars or helicopters. Helicopters, that's the fastest, of course, mean to inspect in big infrastructure grid. And speed is important if you're looking at thousands or tens of thousands of miles of pipeline or electricity grid. But a fully loaded hour of a helicopter flight can cost, up, can cost a lot of money, up to $1,000. So imagine that you can monitor your entire network with a click of a button for a fraction of the price. That's the future life EO is building. 
Over the past couple of decades, uh, years, there's been a tremendous development in Earth observation. So satellite data is really great because it just covers vast amount of area, but it's also pretty hard. You have to know from where you get your satellite data, which one is the right one, you have to uh, deal with different APIs, you have to harmonize the data, then you have to put it into your database, and just then you are able to apply your machine learning algorithm. Luckily, we take care of all of this, and we provide you, the network operators, with the information exactly where external threats can lead to damages for your infrastructure grid. So in one sentence, Live View translates Earth observation for enterprises. Let's look into the use cases, for example, in the pipeline sector. Right now, in some parts of the world, pipelines are overflown every two weeks to make sure that no one, uh, no third party interacts with the pipeline. What we can do from space is detect with millimeters accuracy how the underground um, changes beneath or above a pipeline, and we can identify where construction sites are starting next to pipelines. We estimate that 50% of the helicopter flights can be saved, and therefore also 50% of the OPEX in this use case. The other use case is vegetation next to electricity lines. Right now, more than 6 billion US dollars are spent every year on vegetation management next to overhead lines. That's due to a cycle-based process where every two, every four years, people walk alongside the entire network and maintain vegetation alongside the entire network. What we can do from space is uh, exactly identify parts of the network where maintenance needs to happen because we can see which spans are affected by vegetation. And we can, with this, we can enable to move away from a cycle-based process to a predictive-based process. And the Utility Arborist Association estimates that more than 60% of vegetation management expenditures can be saved. But only having a great analysis is only one part of the equation. The other one is making these insights actionable. We're doing this by either uh, providing our own mobile app and web app or implementing our insights directly into the solutions you're already using. So we're breaking down the analysis in tasks for people on site or statistics for the management uh, and decision makers. Our solution is, is really easy. The longer your network is, the more value we create. And we've already conducted and deployed this technology. We're the only company worldwide which has analyzed more than 20,000 um, miles of railway grid uh, over two years now in Germany. And we are working with some of the biggest utilities of the continent. My co-founder and I, we founded the company. Who our background is aerospace engineering, and we know what's out there and what the technology in the future will bring. But we haven't built this solution on our own. Of course, we are a team of around 20 people based in Berlin. Uh, we've people hired people from Morgan Stanley, from the satellite companies, from SAP, uh, and from, for example, Energy. So we've raised a seed round at the beginning of last year, 1.5 million, and are closing our uh, Series A at the end of this year. And in the future, we will monitor every major infrastructure grid on the planet. So if you want to improve the reliability and safety of your networks, if you want to keep OPEX in balance, then you should choose Live Hero. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sven. Um, so if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask them now, but we were mostly holding off, but we do have three startups that aren't gonna be here today, so you have a little bit of time if you wanna ask any questions to the startups you've heard so far. No? Okay, well, if you ha think of one, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, all right, our next startup will be Kent from Mission Secure, and please join me in giving him a warm welcome. He's coming to us from Houston. As she said, I'm Kent. I'm still trying to wrap my head around I'm gonna say four hours worth of stuff in four minutes, and so it's kinda of gonna be difficult, but Mission Secure was started as a cybersecurity system or a cybersecurity company for operational technologies or critical infrastructures. Uh, get this thing going forward. And so they, uh, when we started as Department of Defense, U.S. Department of Defense contract, trying to understand how you could actually stop Stuxnet. Uh, the big difference between the IT cybersecurity and the OT cybersecurity is the fact on the critical infrastructure on the OT side of things, uh, life, life loss can happen. It, it's not just a matter of, you know, you're losing data or you're going to have to pay some ransom, some, something like that. Uh, things can blow up. 
people could die. And so the critical infrastructure is, is a major component. And so uh, we've spent about 10 years doing research on building an appliance and a technology around letting us be able to do that. We go into these companies and they always talk about we're air gapped. And to this day, 100% of the times we've gone in, they're not air gapped. Um, we've got a demo, Paul can actually show you, our VP of development over here can show you a, a, a live demonstration of a, an assessment that we did on a company that said they were completely air gapped and they had hundreds of connections to the outside world. Uh, and they were going on on a regular basis. And so uh, what Mission Secure is gonna do is provide you visibility into all the different communications that's going on within that critical infrastructure. And, and so you wanna sit there and make sure that you're not only getting the visibility, but you can actually stop it. You can actually protect something while it's doing what it's going on. Uh, and so we've got an appliance that we put out and we go all the way down to level zero. Uh, biggest difference between the majority of the players in our space is they were an IT company and they're now trying to convert themselves to being an OT company. Uh, we started off as an OT side looking at the critical infrastructure. Our, a lot of our developers or a lot of our techs are control systems guys. They came from the control system world. And so this is just our platform. We have the console which allows you to, to, to see all the different devices within the network and kind of get the reporting create policies, configuration. We have an IDS that sits there and monitors the network. It comes off of spam port, sitting there just, it's very passive, but it's sitting there monitoring everything that's going into the network, looking at all the different protocols that are in the control system world, not just IP. Uh, so you're looking at the Modbus. And then our MSI-1 is the device that actually can sit there and stop and prevent things from happening. So it can actually um, block traffic from getting to a particular PLC uh, or to a motor or to an engine, to a pump. Whatever that critical system is, we can sit there. And then the MSI, the Sentinel, is a device that sits there and can actually monitor voltage to understand, you know, for this pump to be open, it should be X voltage. Well, it's not. And so there could be a problem. And so maybe we need to alert or let somebody know something's going on. This is kind of a picture of the devices that we have. Uh, and then literally when you start thinking about, you know, how do you get down to level zero, that's where the protection has to happen. Uh, there's a lot of things that will sit there on the perimeter. Everybody talks about we'll put a firewall on the perimeter, we'll watch the firewall, uh, make sure that, you know, nothing's coming in. We've got an example of a maritime customer where we went in and did an assessment in less than 30 minutes the guy that was doing our assessment for us had complete control of the ship. He could steer it, he could take it wherever it was, he could dump the cargo into the ocean, he could do whatever he wanted to. So these control systems aren't necessarily as secure as everybody thinks. We have the technology and we have customers in all of these different spaces. We're doing a lot in maritime, we're doing a lot in uh, midstream, we're doing quite a bit with smart cities. Uh, we just landed a large contract with Honolulu where we're actually helping deploy things throughout the, the intersections in, in Honolulu. And so with that, I'm out of time. Uh, but we have a demo over here if you guys want to see what, what we do and actually kind of look at some graphs. Thanks for keeping us punctual, Kent. All right, our next write up will be Gecko Robotics, and we have Yvonne presenting um, them for you today. All right, thank you so much, and let's give them a, hand of, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ivan from Gecko Robotics. Uh, we use robots to do jobs that always considered to be a very hard, dangerous, and ones that require incredible focus. Robots can do it faster, safer, and much more accurate than humans. To enjoy effective uh, and safe uh, safe operations, industrial equipment needs to be regularly checked, uh, maintained, or replaced. The problem is that the finding a problem area at a huge plant with manual inspection is like finding a needle in a haystack. That leads to two unfortunate outcomes. Number one, missed problem areas, potentially millions of dollars in direct or indirect damages. And two, overdone repairs. It doesn't look as, as scary, but if you sum up all the associated costs, including shutting down asset or the whole plant to repair areas that only potentially need fixed, it becomes very substantial. We use robots. In this robot, robots provide full coverage of the asset in a, in a very short time. Huge benefit of these inspections is that we minimize the time humans need to spend in places 
but that were not built for people to be in. Not only we collect immense amount of data, we also keep people safe. These are two types of our robots. Both have magnetic wheels uh, that help them crawl any type of carbon steel assets. Both robots are equipped with ultrasonic sensors. Each holds from 8 to 128 ultrasonic sensors. Each sensor collects 10 readings per second. As you can imagine, we collect immense amount of data. All data are processed by our algorithms. Each reading assigns a quality score before it makes to the final report. All data are stored in the database for future reference. With ultrasonic sensors, we can identify three types of defect, material loss, pitting, corrosion, and lamination. That's a sample of the report. That's a power plant boiler. 275 megawatt boiler was inspected with two robots in three shifts. As you hover over any place on this heat map, it will show you the exact position of the reading and the value of the thickness measurement that was taken. You can set a threshold to see only areas concerned or see how the changes evolve over time. This is actually a pretty big asset. The, the height of this boiler is over 100 feet, it's, which is more than 30, 30 meters. And we collected millions and millions of data points. It is humanly impossible to collect this data in a, in a reasonable time. So what asset owners do, they do spot checking. They check here and there. And it, work, it works for certain cases, but not for everything. So uh, the problem with that is that the failure occurs not at the areas that we inspected, but somewhere in between. That's why full coverage is very important in many, many cases. Uh, we have a very mobile equipment uh, and just fly it away from the job. Robots are transported in commercial airline approved cases and at the site we just need access to water electricity and electricity. Uh, in many cases, scaffolding is not required. Uh, this is a very short list of our customers and they mostly fall into three big verticals, power generation, oil and gas, and pulp and paper production. If at the start our goal was to go wide and introduce as many companies to our technology as possible, now our goal is deep into our relationship. And uh, we are preferred providers in some of these companies, but our goal is to deepen the relationship with all everyone and become the sole inspector provider and data supplier. Um, so to summarize, we provide full inspection coverage in the shortest time possible. And what this data gives our customers is minimizing the, uh, the downtime and failures and maximizing asset output. Again, my name is Ivan. I lead international business development. I'm here with my colleague, Queen. He's a technical, uh, technical sales manager, expert in oil and gas. Please talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, for our next startup, we have Tag Jefferson here talking about grid cure. So let's all welcome him to the stage as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Tag, and I run GridCure. At GridCure, we are a collection of data scientists and mathematicians, and like myself, folks who used to work in the utility industry itself. We like to say we're on a mission to bring predictive analytics to the electrical grid. What that actually means is we're building utilities, an app store for their predictive maintenance applications. So we've talked about data a lot already today, so I won't belabor the point, but this is my favorite statistic about the industry. The average transmission and distribution company today is sitting on 100,000 times as much data as they had just 10 years ago. That's a pretty extreme, pretty extreme change, and we finally get to take advantage of it. Uh, to so to sort of get a bit more understanding of what this means to utilities, this, this number, this 400 billion, is what utilities globally have already budgeted to spend on smart grid specific software, specific to analysis. Again, that's money that they've already allocated in their budgets over the next five years uh, to buy products exactly like ours. 
So uh, coming a little bit more back to what we do, uh, we're a platform, we have a variety of applications. We pipe data in from existing utility data stores. We don't install any new sensors, don't install any new servers. Bring that onto our platform. We have these pre-built, ready-to-go applications that are able to create recommendations around, hey, this transformer is going to explode, or hey, this cable should be replaced, and then present it back to the users in the form of these browser-based uh, modules. Um, this is how we make money. We do bill on a software as a service basis, but we spend a fair bit of legal effort making, uh, making it possible for regulated utilities to put us in their capital budget. For the utilities in the room, this means that you get to make 10% on our product every year regardless. Um, we do work with very large utilities excuse me, around the world, uh, so a few of these up on the slide right now. But to touch a little bit on the scale with which we can operate, Couple of customers we landed just last week include a very tiny utility in Kansas with 22,000 endpoint customers. And we also got TNB over in Malaysia, over 30 million customers. And those were both just last week. Um, fundamentally, what we're bringing our clients uh, is a combination of benefits. So for some utilities who need to lower their operational budgets, we can do that pretty dramatically. Uh, we've got a good case study where we brought down an OPEX inspection budget by 90%. We can also save time. Typically, there's a fair bit of engineering resources thrown at spreadsheets just to understand what's happening on the network, what needs to be fixed, maintained, repaired. Uh, and then for the end customers, the folks actually sitting in the room here, we can dramatically increase reliability. So uh, one of my favorite case studies is a client we worked with recently where we were able to identify three times as many problems on their network before they actually happened compared to the utility's existing business practices. And this utility wasn't, uh, wasn't in the dark ages by any stretch of the imagination. They thought they were the top of their game. We came in with their existing data, no new sensors, no new servers, were able to beat their existing process by a factor of three. Um, another one of our modules, looking more closely at smart meter data, we were able to fundamentally change how, utilities, how this utility interacted with their customers. They could much more reliably and confidently say, hey, customer, this is why you're having power problems, this is why your lights are flickering. Um, this is a few of our key team members, my, Emily, my colleague Emily is in the back there. Um, we do come from the utility space, I mentioned some of us are, are rock and mathematics degrees. Um, and these are some of our partners and investors. So we were uh, part of Free Electrons last year, and we're backed by globally recognized investors like 500 Startups. We'd love to show you some more of our demo uh, after this. Come and find us. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. That was a great presenting voice. Um, all right, our next startup is we have Dan Katz coming to us from San Francisco, uh, Orbital Sidekick. All right, let's welcome him to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Katz. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Orbital Sidekick. Um, and we use uh, our own hyperspectral imaging sensors and analytics platform that we deployed on our own uh, satellite platforms up in the space to monitor energy infrastructure on a global persistent basis. Um, as some other people have shared here today with some of the other companies, uh, what we've focused on initially within the energy sector is midstream, specifically pipelines. Um, much like the rest of our uh, nation's infrastructure, they're, it's aging uh, and they're everywhere. Um, so there have been some major pipeline incidents that result in environmental damage, uh, lots of billions have been spent on remediation efforts and even uh, loss of life and uh, injuries. So it's clearly a big problem here uh, on with pipeline monitoring. Um, and the, the the tricky part here is that pipeline monitoring technology has been stuck in the 1960s. Um, in the U.S. today, we monitor three million miles of pipeline using uh, old small aircraft where a pilot is sticking their head out the window trying to see signs of leaks or uh, construction activity along the right-of-way. And the reporting that the pilots do uh, is generally in the form of a handwritten note or maybe a text message. So Orbital Sidekick, uh, we work to uh, monitor pipelines using uh, a, a vertical approach where we start with the constellation of hyperspectral satellites that, that we'll be deploying uh, by the end of next year uh, to provide daily monitoring of pipeline assets globally. Uh, we use hyperspectral imagery and analysis. So hyperspectral, for those that don't know, uh, I like to say it's like chemical fingerprinting, 
We collect hundreds of color bands in the visible and infrared light regions, and so that allows us to effectively see the unseen. We can identify and speciate hydrocarbons, methane, soil disturbances, um, and, and a whole host of other uh, very actionable insights. And, and so the last part is really, as a, as a pipeline operator, as an asset integrity manager, what you don't really care actually about where you get your data from, you just want to know is my monitoring in compliance with DOT FEMSA, regulatory compliance? Uh, is it safe? Is there a risk? Is it leaking? Are there intrusions? Are there encroachments? Um, any kind of contamination? And so that's why we built out Sigma, which is our global monitoring application and web-based user platform. Uh, so Sigma allows you to see with a, a very precise, actionable information. It's centralized, it's archivable, auditable, um, and easily accessible for all operators. Um, so just a couple examples of, of real data captured from our platforms, be able to identify a storage tank leak from a storage tank leak from a tank battery. Um, and here's actually some data from our uh, first space platform. It's on the International Space Station. Uh, we captured uh, a terminal leak due to Hurricane Dorian back in September. Um, so We've already cornered about 30% of the pipeline market with initial contracts and pilot programs. So you probably recognize some of the names up there. Um, pipelines for us, regulatory compliance, pipeline safety and monitoring, that's really just the beginning. It's our way to get our, the foothold within the energy sector, but we do have bigger aspirations. Uh, looking at the broader geospatial solutions market, now that we have, that we're building and creating this massive proprietary hyperspectral data infrastructure in space, what can we do with that really powerful data? So we started looking at things like new energy exploration. So geologic hydrogen, looking at natural hydrogen fields, is a big, big play for us coming up. Looking for sources, new sources of lithium and cobalt. Um, these are things we're already working on. Um, and having those partners within the energy industry now will help us grow uh, and, and become a more viable uh, solution provider in the future. Uh, we built out a great team, heavy on hyperspectral data analytics, uh, embedded systems and aerospace engineers, and a lot of really good uh, board members and advisors within the energy industry itself. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Dan. Okay, let's all welcome for our next startup we have um, Oh, I knew this was going to happen. Uh, Rian from Connect City. So please, let's all welcome him to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is uh, Rayan Arif. I'm the co-founder of Connect City Smart Technology Platform. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about um, what we do. Essentially, we bring data to life in real time. So what are some of the problems that uh, are faced by many of the industries today? Um, some of the areas that we're addressing, problems with airport terminals, um, airlines managing you know, fuel costs, overheads, labor, flight delays, you know, poor service. Uh, on buildings, uh, about 70% of the stock in building, uh, buildings is about, it's still analog, it's still pneumatic. Uh, devices. There's no data, there's no intelligence coming out of that. There's nothing we can do with that. Also, it's a huge problem in terms of energy consumption. You know, 90% of the building costs was built, wasn't built to modern code. So if you have an earthquake in California, that's a lot of buildings that are not up to code. Um, we also deal with waste management, again, looking at fuel costs, overheads, and efficiencies in that area. Uh, also around environmental damage and poor utilization. So, a uh, quick video that will uh, show you exactly what our platform does.
So everything you see there, essentially our platform, um, that was a real representation of various verticals that we've already done work in. Essentially our platform is like a 3D bird's eye view. All the data is brought together. Intelligence is added to it with geolocation, sensors. Uh, essentially it's like a sensor and data fusion. Um, and one of the things we do is we bring all the various layers that are needed to make that platform work. That could be AutoCAD drawings for buildings, BIM modeling, ESRI data. It could be RFID sensors, various types of sensors. Whatever our customer needs in terms of making uh, smarter decisions, more efficient decisions, we'll bring them into the platform to work on a single platform. The goal actually is, or, what, or the end, uh, users, as you're looking at, is our UX UI. Essentially, the, the idea is that everybody can interact easily without any friction and have all the, the available information at their fingertips. An example of some of the connectivity, you know, we'll deploy some of the industry um, connectivity devices. We'll bring them all together. As much sensors that you can add to any device, we'll take that data. And, and, and link it to our platform to create this solution. Um, example, in a public waste company in Trapani, um, there were 6,000 containers that were brought under the system. You know, average fill levels of collection went down, you know, uh, went up from 60 to 85 percent. You know, also looking at like, there's a 60 percent increase in container durability. Um, typically, we look for a 30 to 40 percent cost saving for uh, the companies. Uh, for Alitalia, um, they essentially were running pretty much a manual system, email, paper-based system. Um, in, in Rome, we essentially built a digital platform for them where they could operate all the resources, all the planes, and everything into you know, one, one single system. And that includes things like arrivals, departure times, uh, flight connections, boarding, onboarding. Uh, runways and taxis and departure. Some of the, the verticals we've already de de deployed this technology in is, uh, since you were mentioned, airports, waste management, uh, smart parking, and smart asset management. That's managing lots of buildings together and uh, managing it as a, a single asset. Some of the projects that we've already done this work and we're continuing to do the work on is, as you see, a pretty big list there. Uh, we have global partners. Uh, we've already uh, done this for a number of people in terms of different engagements. Uh, we've got about 100 plus years of combined experience in manufacturing and supply chain and automotive industry. And uh, you know, if you um, have any questions or anything else, I'll be over there. Highly encourage you to take a look at our demo. We'll be able to show you how some of these systems work. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Rian. Um, I want to stop again and ask if anyone has any questions for the startups we've just heard. If you have, if you want to ask them now, you you can. Okay, otherwise feel free to meet them afterwards. Um, our next startup, we have Helios Exchange. We have Pierre, Pierre here to come and speak to us about them. All right, thank you. Let's all welcome him to the stage. Hi everyone, my name is Pierre Trevet. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Helios Exchange. And we provide an online platform to streamline, accelerate, and scale building energy retrofits in commercial buildings and do that at utility scales. Um, Buildings are everywhere, obviously, and it's, uh, it consumes 40% of the world's energy use, and about 30 to 40% of energy saving opportunity are sitting out there, but very hard to capture. Uh, what we see is that facility managers be beyond, behind the meter, they have a hard time identifying retrofit opportunities. When they do, they tend not to trust the savings, so they don't really deploy their own capital, and they lack access to financing. So what we've done at Helios, we've created an end-to-end -end process to be able to start by create a building energy twin, a digital twin for how building energy use energy. And we've been able to deploy that at scale 
over over larger um, over 20 cities in the U.S. representing about 20 billion square feet real estate, 50 billion in annual energy costs, and we do that by deploying building energy modeling and coupled with AI to really get the best representation of how buildings use energy. So it's like an, uh, a, a real estate platform already equipped these buildings, and we're able to run our technology to identify projects, whether they be energy efficiency within the projects, and whether distributed energy, and then when it comes to really gaining confidence in the savings, we have a unique technology to model those projects stochastically so that we can ensure the risk of performance and finance as a service, and then monitor the transaction all the way through. So doing the, so is really a way to really slash the project development costs are very costly, especially when it comes to going into smaller size uh, mean market buildings. So already deploy that at scale, uh, and you can go online, identify a building, already run different scenarios of energy retrofit, and identify close to 10 billion in energy savings opportunity that we can help you develop and finance. Uh, net net, we're slashing transaction costs by a factor of three, and thus enabling the capture of that uh, virtual energy resource that is untapped for most part of the world. So I'm gonna give you a quick demo. Uh, you could see them out here. We've actually increased the number of buildings, but you can browse and search, go to cities, New York, Washington, LA, wherever you want, or bring your building on demand and identify, you know, based on the, the benchmarks, energy savings opportunities. Uh, you know, we're gonna click and identify a building. We already run a full simulation. You already see a business case uh, with the project cars here. It's, uh, close to 2.4 million estimated energy costs with annual savings 400. We do the business case, RI, impact on asset value, uh, listing the energy saving measures, the energy cost reduction, PD demand savings, and we're comparing different financing options that can be financed to our financing partners, whether through PACE, efficiency service agreement as a service, or traditional loans. So behind this is the building energy simulator uh, that allowed to model the cooling, uh, lighting, heating, and all the loads that you have in a building, and we run the retrofit explorer that quantify the savings by different measures that we have in li libraries that are selected through AI, and that allow us to quantify and select projects, analyze these, identify the energy savings, document them, and literally digitize the work that energy service companies have been doing, mostly in their public sector market uh, with uh, schools, hospitals, etc. very little in their commercial sector. Thanks to that, we're able to run the retrofit uh, risk assessment to be able to go quickly to be able to gain confidence. So NetNet, -Net, I'll tell you more about it. We're, we're having a strong traction in, in France and Europe where the market are strongly regulated. So we operate uh, between the US and, and, uh, and Europe. Um, and be happy to show you how it could uh, help you as a utility uh, leverage your program to uh, uh, sell efficiency as a service, identify customers, and help uh, reduce the load on your grids. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, thank you so much, Pierre. So our next, uh, per, uh, we have Keith coming to us from Boston, and the rest of his team is, is in Israel, so let's uh, thank him for coming on the stage today. Uh, Bright Merge, all right, thank you so much. Hi there, my name is Keith Lehman. I'm CTO and one of the founding members of Bright Merge. Don't usually let me out very often. We are building a SaaS platform to help the financiers, designers, builders, and operators create microgrids more efficiently and with a better return on investment. The problem today is that the current energy networks are broken. They're old, unreliable, dirty. We see this here everywhere in the world. We see it here in California. This situation is going, only going to get worse as climate change affects the underlying infrastructure that drives our energy networks. Microgrids are the solution. These networks of locally generated and managed re energy resources, renewable energy resources, are more efficient, more cost effective, more reliable than the current infrastructure. There are thousands of microgrids in operation today. But the world needs to reach a scale of hundreds of millions, so why don't we see more of them? The reason is that they're complex to design, build, and operate. We solve this problem with an enterprise SaaS platform that helps the decision makers make better decisions, 
based on real data, based on a real understanding of the financial, underlying financial performance of their networks. Products broken into four phases. We begin with the techno-financial feasibility. We begin with the techno-financial feasibility study. I'm sorry, <laughs> a little nervous. We begin with the techno-financial feasibility study so that we can understand the financial performance of, the, of a particular microgrid and properly size the underlying components. Next, to the design and procurement phase, we automatically select the optimal com components. Staying with, the project, staying with the project through design, procurement, and into operations, we continue to monitor and allow the financial decision makers and everybody else to understand the impacts of their choices. Oops. Finally, the solution includes an underlying IoT world to cloud optimization platform that continuously monitors and optimizes energy utilization, improving the owner's return on investment. Under the hood, we're combining crowdsourced, private, and public data sets with an automated AI to provide the features that our customers need. In typical case study, we're able to reduce the, the OPEX by 10 to 25 percent and the CAPEX by 10 to 15 percent, producing a much better ROI. Whoops. So where are we today? I'm sorry. Um, with a recurring revenue SaaS model, we're able to tap into a total addressable market of $24 billion annually by 2024 and a market that is expected to grow exponentially over the next decade. We're led by an experienced team. We've got over 20 years of experience in, in uh, energy, two startups. I hope that you, I haven't plugged this too much, <laughs> and that you'll come and talk to, speak to me afterwards. Thank you. Great, thank you. Oh, those are yours. I'll take the clicker though. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Keith, for that presentation. You did great. Um, the next startup is Toku with Toku Systems. So let's all give them a round of applause. Thank you. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Toku Systems. Uh, just quickly. The future that I see, just a minute quicker. Does it click? Okay, good. Uh, these are the group of people I work with, and um, our company slogan is uh, we work together and basically bring the diversity, uh, unity out of diversity is our vision. And then vision is coming from the fact that we worked with a company prior to this together for over 20 years and realized there's a need for these industrial grade sensor to be available to your smartphone or website. That is not the case today. And we call it industry IoT or whatever you might call it, but that's the future we need to be addressing. And there's a big opportunity to come. I'm looking at the upstream only, not midstream, downstream or big plants. It's upstream. 90% of oil well, gas well, do not have a monitoring system. And shifting uh, demography is, as you know, that uh, experienced people are leaving industry. Downstream, midstream te technologies are a little bit too expensive for, for upstream. So what is happening today is that you look at 
the upstream entire oil world, probably 1.3 to 1.1 uh, million oil well, gas well combined, and 90% has nothing. This is the not offshore, but onshore, and including a brown field. How do we deal with that? It has always been a difficulty. We came up with a solution, and that sensor that I showed you, that's connected to this uh, plastic can. We have been solving this uh, diverse problem into unit, how do you bring that to unity into diverse problem is, one of the secret is in enabling all the sensor to be connected in the field as is, and then make it available to the, in the form of data in a customer hand. One of the big barrier was class one, division one, zone zero. That's the intrinsic safety design. That's not available. Your smartphone is not able to go to the field and be installed. That's just not possible. Plus, it has to be able to handle minus 40 degrees Celsius. In fact, this device can handle minus 50 degrees Celsius. So there's a technical uh, reason as well as financial reasons why it cannot do. Now, once you achieve this, the big difference begins to show. Uh, example that I'm showing is uh, one company was 200 well, roughly 20 kilometer, 12 miles square. How are you going to look after this well? So this is successfully installed, 24 seven, 200 well. This is capable of producing five to 15% more just because properly instrumented. It's only done in five days, not three months. So customer has been using this different approaches and we have been able to penetrate the market. US, uh, Canada, and then Japan, Indonesia. And it recently went to Barbados and uh, it's a water business, a water utility looking for leakage detection. What we wanna do is basically, as I said, there are so many sensors out there, third party sensors that are not available as the data. So many application software wants the data. We connect them. And then customer only need to worry about what, when, uh, where, we derive, derive how. And hence, unity out of diversity is our slogan. Thank you. All right, thank you, Toku. Next up, we have Doyle Irvin from uh, Palo Alto with Preddy. So let's all welcome him to the stage. Green to click. All right, which one is it? Green. Green. The red mostly means stop. Hi, everybody. Tagging data is awful. That's what we're here to do. Um, my name is Doyle Irvin. I'm here on the Predi team. I always enjoy coming to Plug and Play. Um, so, hello. Um, so Predi is an augmented analytics platform. Uh, and that's kind of a niche term that not everyone's gonna know, so we'll let Gartner define it for us. Augmented analytics is the use of enabling technologies, such as machine learning, natural language processing, and AI, to assist with data preparation and generating insights um, to plug them into your analytics and BI tools. Um, and so we are in that category. Um, now, when it comes to us, what we do is service data, asset management. That's our secret sauce. This is what we you know, live and breathe every day. So what kind of service data is, is out there for you to leverage? I mean, there's field visits, there's sensor, sensor data coming from the equipment, there's emails, there's customer surveys, um, there's product manuals created by the, the OEs who manufacture the equipment, and there's a whole lot of tribal knowledge, and tribal knowledge is the key. So to give you an example of how augmented analytics comes into play here, I know that every enterprise in the room today, somewhere in your enterprise, there's a team that follows this process. Uh, you collect raw data, you have a team of knowledge workers, um, or subject matter experts who are processing it or putting it into a, a category. Um, and they create annotated data that then gets loaded into your ERP, 
and deployed either to your own workforce or your, to your customers um, in the form of a data-driven product or workflow. Some examples from our customers here. Um, a few of our customers were processing repair orders to create repair guidance for their technicians. Um, and so they had a team of technicians uh, going through their repair history, extracting what the customer was complaining about, uh, what was diagnosed to be the cause of this complaint, and the eventual resolution, parts and labor, that resolved the complaint. And then that was loaded into a product um, that technicians used to uh, fix things faster the next time they uh, encountered the same issue. Um, when we first started working with them, they had a team uh, reading about 50 to 70,000 of these per year. And now every month we process the entire backlog of two billion jobs, um, and it's the largest such case in the world. Um, and the technicians who use this guidance product are cutting down the diagnostic time by 50%. <clears throat> Another example here um, is uh, Nissan. Our customer was processing customer surveys um, to try and identify which components were annoying their customers the most. What, when they were turning in their surveys, was the top thing that they complained about you know, my Bluetooth or the navigation or, or what have you. So they had quality engineers uh, reading these surveys and categorizing them. This is an issue with the Bluetooth. This is an issue with the, you know, it's an, a loud car um, to find out what the voice of the customer truly is. Um, and a third example of what our customers are doing, uh, they, they have the dealership and franchisee business model, so they create the equipment but they don't sell it and they don't service it. Um, and so the various franchises are required to send the data back up to HQ, but they're not required to use the same ERPs. They're not required to have the data in the same formats. Um, and so in order for the original equipment manufacturer to understand what's happening in the field, which parts are being sold, what labor operations are being used to resolve issues, they need to normalize and tag all this different data into one consistent system. And that's what we're here to do. Automatic expert level interpretation of various data sources and unstructured data and difficult data um, so we can free up your engineers and your experts time to actually use the data instead of wasting time and money preparing it for action. So we exist to apply structure to unstructured data. Um, we take your noisy, untagged data that's not ready for digital products and workflows. We run it through our platform, which is a number of you know, proprietary uh, algorithms, and we give it back to you in a way that's structured, easy to build uh, digital products on, and new workflows. So what is the pretty advantage? We reduce the costs and the startups uh, required in order to get an AI project off the ground. Uh, we provide consistent processing results, um, we're fast, and we elevate your employees for serious work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Doyle. Um, we next, we have Yubik from Taiwan, but natively from Palo Alto. Um, this is an also a new interesting fact that Jay Wei just shared with me is Ubique means excellence will prosper. So let's all give him a round of applause. He's also on the IoT selection day tomorrow. So here you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay. I'm the co-founder of Ubique, and we are a profitable startup that has developed a new low-power, long-range wireless technology specifically for smart grids. So the opportunity when we first started this company four and a half years ago, a uh, huge opportunity, opportunity up for grabs was there was a Taiwan government tender to connect 3.5 million electricity meters throughout the whole country. This advanced metering infrastructure project required these residential and corporate meters to send their energy data every 15 minutes wirelessly it needed to be at 99.5% success rate. Every packet needed to be acknowledged. 
This network needed to support firmware over the air and a short on-demand control latency. So as a technology agnostic system integrator, our company surveyed all the off-the-shelf wireless technologies, cellular, RF mesh, low-power wide area network technologies, and a lot of proprietary technologies. And we realized for rural and suburban environments, these technologies covered these environments very well. They were very well suited for these environments. But we realized for rural, very dense cities with 2,000 to 5,000 households in a square mile, there was huge room for improvement. So the problem we saw was for the off-the-shelf wireless technologies, when squeezed into urban dense environments, they became absurdly expensive and they were failing to meet some of the evolving advanced metering infrastructure requirements. You can imagine cellular requires a SIM card in every single meter. That's quite a high monthly operating expenditure every month. And for the other proprietary technologies, which requires you to build out the, the network, they were deploying tons, substantial amounts of hardware infrastructure to collect, connect the, the meters. So our solution was we developed our own software protocol stack for a wireless technology called Weightless. It's embedded in two main hardware components, the base station and the end device module. When you plug in the base station, you get anywhere from two to four miles radius coverage in very dense urban environments. It's extremely low power, and the end devices with the end device module embedded inside can enjoy years of battery life, even off small coin cell batteries. And it's extremely scalable. So given some of the requirements of advanced metering infrastructure, um, one of the requirements obviously is updating every 15 minutes. Given this requirement of every 15 minute updates, 20 to 40 bytes, a single base station can, can connect up to 2,000 meters given these requirements. This is far more than any other technologies we, re we reviewed and competed against. And it also allows bi-directional communication. So we have paid deployments connecting utilities, of course, which is our focus, connecting EV fleet chargers, panic buttons for universities and offices. We do a wide array of factory sensor networks. One cool project that we have going on here in the US is helping um, Factories go paperless, so we're connecting e-paper digital signage in their factories. And then we also connect solar panels. So here's our story, um, which kind of outlines our traction. So after two years of R&D, we finished the protocol stack, we released hardware. We competed in the nation's, lar Taiwan's largest AMI tender. After 13 months of due diligence by the Taiwan Power Company and competing against other 13 global vendors, our technology was proven to be the most reliable, the most scalable, the most cost-effective. So we sealed the, uh, the, we won the contract for 8.5 million US dollars to connect the first 75,000 meters. This past August, we completed that network deployment and based off cost effectiveness and performance, we signed recently, three months ago, another 15.5 million US dollar contract to connect another 210,000 meters. And we wrapped up 2019 with some nice awards, including the AWS Startup Challenge, and we were named IEEE Startup of the Year for 2019. And today we have over 100 paying customers spread over 30 countries. Here's a snapshot of our customers. Our biggest customers are Rakuten and the Taiwan Power Company. So while we're here, I'm here to speak with the utility companies here in the room who are tuning in digitally. Um, we wanna do some pilots to really prove that we can decrease costs for AMI rollouts in urban areas, increase network performance, and also expand this AMI network to other IoT applications. So I look forward to, to talking to you guys more. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Okay, for our next up, we have Jason coming from New York and for the first time to the Plug and Play building. So thank you so much with Scanify. Uh, let's welcome him to the stage. <laughs> What's up, plug and play? Let's get some energy going, especially those who made it with the virus. Early morning flight from New York. All right, I'm Jason. Uh, we are Scanafly. So I'm going to talk to you about solar energy. Ten years ago, the world energy mix was 0.1% solar. Now it's about 2%. In 2050, they forecast it will be 25%, which is pretty important for combating climate change. But if solar contractors don't change their ways, we're probably not gonna get there. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. This is the basis for solar design, satellite imagery. 
It works great for the sales process, not so great for an accurate design. It's pixelated, outdated, especially in developing markets. And as a result, 90% of solar contractors visit the site to verify data before they build. When on site, hopefully they don't look like this, but a lot of them do, using ladders, which is dangerous and increases insurance premiums. When they're on the roof, they're using handheld tools like tape measures to get dimensions or archaic shading tools. Write everything down on paper. Could take up to a day. That's the output. Give that to the designer. Hopefully he figures it out. And then the installation team tries to install. Leads to slowdowns, change orders, compression of margins. It might be funny, but it's not. The current manual processes in solar are creating inaccuracies, hazardous working conditions, wasted time, and leading to billions of lost profits. So that's what we're trying to solve. We've created a 3D modeling software for solar contractors that uses drone imagery and AI to automate the solar development process, creating a more efficient, accurate, safer, and lower cost process. So here's how it works. Solar contractors fly their drones on site. If they don't have drones, we have a third party pilot network that they can hire. It takes just about 10 minutes to fly the drone on site. They get a bunch of pictures of the project. They upload it to our cloud-based portal that stitches it together using the photogrammetry method to create a two-scale virtual replica 3D model. The solar contractor can then design in that 3D space to simulate uh, a shading report, production, a full layout, and push the documents to CAD or other exports. Here's what the finished product looks like. And this is actually the high school that you saw in the satellite image, so a major difference, right? There are a bunch of benefits to using Scanafly. You're saving up to 90% of your time on site and there's far greater safety. You're staying off the roof until construction. You're getting near perfect accuracy. You can measure anything, whether it's a tree or an angle of a roof. And drone imagery is eight times better resolution than satellite imagery. Increasing sales volume. So you could survey about five times more projects per day. And we're seeing our customers scale with us. Our shading tool is among the most accurate in the world. It's the only drone-based tool that's been approved by states. Uh, New York, Massachusetts, and we were just on the phone with the California Energy Commission. And that's regarding this, which is new build, which is critical because satellite imagery doesn't have new build. And in California, starting this year, all new construction has to go solar. And of course, there are financial benefits. Here's an example project for uh, like the high school uh, commercial building, like the high school that I just showed you. We charge customers on a per project basis. We have customers all across the US and in several countries outside the US. We have a lot of inbound interest globally as well, and we've captured all of this without doing any sales or marketing. It's all been word of mouth, and that will hopefully change soon. We see residential and commercial solar as our beachhead market. Uh, we see about $2 billion in engineering spend in those spaces, and I'm primarily talking about the US. Globally, we see it at 10 billion, and that's just right now. Obviously, it's gonna grow significantly over the next couple of years. And we have a pathway to moving into other industries where we see solar specific features to be transferable, like utility asset management, vegetation studies, and architecture. Our team has combined 25 years of solar and software experience. We've done every job in the solar industry except manufacturing. John has designed over 2,000 solar projects in his career. I helped finance over $3 billion of clean energy assets. And Dennis has a background in software for many years as well as 3D printing. And lastly, we are currently raising at the moment, um, we are raising upwards of a million dollars with the goal to accelerate our sales and triple the team size with the hope to reach 200 customers and get about a million in revenue by the end of the year. So if you wanna get involved in the future of solar, come talk to me and we'd love to, uh, to chat. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. All right, we're down to our last few startups. We have about five left for the evening or the afternoon. So with fur without further ado, we have Swarnov with Touchlight here for us today. All right, let's welcome him up to the stage. Hello, everyone. My name is Swarnov. I am uh, one of the three founders at Touchlight. Um, and we work with residential and small commercial property owners and help them achieve energy independence from the grid. So today we work with uh, commercial properties and residential assets that specifically have a focus on achieving three goals, energy efficiency, carbon reduction, and energy resilience, meaning they have critical equipment on site that they cannot lose power for, dealing with blackouts or brownouts. Now typically to be able to achieve this today, 
uh, you usually are turning towards solar and battery storage. However, in order to go ahead and actually achieve grid independence, that system remains extremely expensive today. And most people are right now purchasing battery storage for time of use optimization in certain markets, much like California. This is where we come in. We've developed software that enables energy independence or grid islanding from the grid in a very economical method, effectively reducing the number of batteries that you need on site in order to achieve the same level of resilience, keeping your power on for 24 hours plus. And we're already working with homeowners and commercial properties across the US enabling this. Now this is how it works. It breaks down into three key features that our software and our AI program has. It's a series of different deep learning models that learn and optimize continuously how your property uses energy. Before you even deploy solar and storage, our customers that are using us today are saving up to 30% on energy costs through HVAC optimization and smart plug optimization. We take this a step further and we enable property islanding continuously optimizing the way a building is using energy and load shifting once you have solar and battery storage on site in order to turn on different pieces of equipment, high energy appliances like your HVAC at different times in order to make sure you're using as much solar power as possible as opposed to drawing energy from the grid. And finally, we enable blackout prevention, and we do this through curtailment methods, effectively tagging every smart appliance that we're connecting to and tagging them either as a low priority, mid priority, or high priority uh, piece of equipment, effectively creating a new form of base load for what that property needs to continue to operate at what feels like 100% of capacity. Effectively, to summarize what our software is being able to do, we're saving residential customers about $12,000 on battery costs and commercial accounts about $100,000 in battery costs today. Now, how does this help you as a utility, asset manager, homeowner, or commercial owner? Uh, it specifically works and helps you with grid monetization, improving your resiliency on site, improving and reducing your carbon footprint, and most importantly, helping you speed up your transition towards deploying new microgrid infrastructure. As many of you guys are aware, PG&E recently had a number of rolling blackouts that was nationally televised last year. In that kind of a situation, we've been working with different homeowners and commercial properties, keeping their properties online, which allows you as a utility company to now focus on your side operations while we keep your customers happy during this transitionary period. My name is Swarnav Pajari. I am one of the three founders at Touchlight, and we help residential and small commercial property owners achieve energy independence. I'd love to tell you more about the software we've developed. I'll be around uh, later after today. Thank you. Thank you, Swarnav. All right, our next startup, we have Chris coming from uh, Blue Planet Earth, and their team is based in Honolulu, so it's a very fitting name. All right, let's all welcome Chris to the stage. Aloha. So it's a, a company's Blue Planet Energy. I'm Chris Johnson, CEO. Uh, we are based in Hawaii, but have operations in California and Puerto Rico as well. Uh, founded in 2015, we are an energy storage product company. And uh, as you've heard from some of the other companies here, we play a, a role in there. So essentially, if you're using Keith's tool to, to do some research on co uh, what kind of products to use, and you want the best, safest, most reliable, and most powerful products, you're going to choose ours. Our vision is a world where all electricity is generated locally through safe, resilient, renewable energy sources. So when we were founded in 2015, it was really to crack that, that challenge around the energy storage um, uh, hardware and software needs to make that happen. So what we do to make that happen is we enable energy and, gr and, uh, and resi uh, resilience and independence through a scalable uh, energy storage technology we call Blue Ion. And that delivers uh, a battery-based microgrid, both the hardware and software components that allow you to, to uh, adopt more clean energy. So we are actually also in the process of raising funds, uh, even though we have grown a lot and are a profitable company. Now we are looking to put together an a, a, a institutional round uh, uh, of equity as well as a revolving debt facility. So if you're interested in that, we'd love to talk to you about that. Anybody here ever played the video game Tetris? couple, the rest of you still sleeping. Okay, 
we got to get through this. We'll get to the happy hour. So our founder is actually the, the visionary and entrepreneur behind the video game Tetris. He wasn't really setting out to make a new company, uh, but he went to put solar on his house in Hawaii in 2014, and the utility wouldn't let him interconnect because too much penetration on the circuit. And so he knew he had to figure out how to figure out energy storage. So he's now been living off-grid for five and a half years with our, our first-generation energy storage product, really proof in the pudding, you know, eating the dog food there. So he brought me in a couple years ago to scale this team. Uh, I guess three years ago now, and we've got a really talented team, over 25 people, and uh, really dedicated to our mission of decarbonizing our energy systems. So just to put the little context there, a lot of folks uh, s skip over the uh, safety issues with energy storage. They, you know, they all look at the software side of energy storage, but let's not forget that this is actually a really dangerous thing. And if we look to South Korea and the lessons there from over 21 fires over the course of a year and leading to over 600 energy storage installations getting shut down, we think it's very important to not gloss over the safety aspect uh, when it comes to this. So the EV uh, technologies that are driving energy storage systems are not always appropriate to put in our uh, homes and businesses. So what did we do? We introduced the Blue Ion as a best-in-class product. Uh, so first, uh, the, the product on the left here was our initial product, been out for about two and a half years now. Uh, we thought it was going to be mostly residential, um, and that has uh, evolved a lot. We have a lot of commercial installations, so we just released the uh, LX product, which is uh, targeted at commercial uh, systems. We see it as important to make it easy to design, purchase, install and service these. And so we've really focused on the integration with other components on site uh, through the software and hardware innovations there. So in terms of how we compare, uh, we, as I said, we have the, the, the safety that comes from the chemistry we use, the iron phosphate, not only prevents the fire uh, thermal runaway risk, but it also gives you a longer lasting product. So you're able to cycle these more. Anywhere you have a high cycling, high performance need, this is a, a very compelling technology and we'd love to find uh, ways to uh, uh, help you deploy that. Our customers, uh, over 300 installations to date, about half residential, half commercial. Uh, we do that through a dealer network of over 170 now in, uh, uh, certified installers. Uh, installations in over 25 states and now growing organically outside the U.S. through folks who find us across off-grid, resilience, and weak grids, including with the uh, largest resilience project in the country done with the American Red Cross of over 110 microgrids in Puerto Rico. Uh, so, give you a sense of some of that. We do have patent pending on our, our new LX product. Um, and uh, if you're interested in talking some more about our performance and, and our history and our product, I'd love to talk to you some more over here. Mahalo. Oh, thank you, Chris. Okay. So, for our next startup, okay, guys, we're almost there. You don't have to leave just yet. No, it's okay. Um, they, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, uh, the next startup we have Sean presenting Terrapin Geothermics. Um, and let's all give him a round of applause and then, you know, keep the energy up. We're almost there. Last three. We're right there. Let's go. Yeah, this might be one of the last pitch events we all get for a little while, so we've got to keep the energy up. <laughs> so, so my name's Sean Collins, uh, and I'm really excited to share with you our vision for building the world's first heat-to-value development platform. So Sean Collins, I'm the founder of the organization, and I've been running it since we started about three years ago. Our, our focus is, as a company is on heat, and we're all in on the value that heat is going to have in the global energy transition. Our beachhead strategy has been to focus on development of industrial waste heat to power projects with longer term focuses on direct heat and geothermal applications. And so the, the stat that I like to throw out to sort of capture people's attention about this is the fact that about 58% of energy produced in the world every year is lost as rejected energy. So if you run the numbers, it's about 280,000 petajoules of energy that's lost every year. And capturing about 5% of that is actually enough energy to heat and power every household in the United States. The challenge with heat, though, is that heat as heat doesn't transport very far. Converting heat into electricity is what unlocks its value and creates baseload emission-free electricity at some of the highest capacity factors of any form of power generation on Earth. 
And so this is what we focus Terrapin on, creating a beachhead strategy of going after the world's largest waste heat resource owners in an inverted business model. So our focus is, is securing resource rights to the best waste heat resources in, in the world simply by buying them off of industrial operators. We then integrate the best in class west, waste heat to power technology. We secure third party finance in a similar business model to Solar City and then partner with EPC construction partners to construct and commission the facilities. This isn't a theoretical business model, and we found a tremendous amount of success so far in the Canadian marketplace, where we have about $90 million in projects under active development. This is a snapshot of an ideal project for, from Terrapin's perspective. We secured waste heat resource rights from TC Energy to a compressor station in Canada. We secured Canadian exclusivity for Exergy's organic rank and cycle engine technology. And we have a signed joint venture with Capstone Infrastructure that is a $1.3 billion electricity developer. Our overarching focus on the industrial waste heat opportunity is the niche of midstream natural gas and the billions of dollars in project opportunities that exist at compressor stations, fractionation plants, and processing facilities within the natural gas supply chain. Over time, we're interested in extending our development platform to the opportunity in geothermal energy, largely due to the fact that geothermal energy holds the distinct title of being the only source of baseload renewable heat available and will be a mission critical piece of the global energy transition. We're thrilled to share that this summer we were able to secure a $25.5 million subsidy from the federal government of Canada for our Alberta number one geothermal project. And to date, we've been able to build a really specialized and proven team that have built some of the largest waste heat to power projects in North America history, and an advisory group that includes folks like Carl Johansson, who's the former president of TransCanada. We're also thrilled to share that Janice Tran will be joining us from Generate Capital towards the end of the month to help us really grow our US business as well as our access to capital, both in North America and internationally. We've been thrilled to participate in the first batch of the plug and play program in Houston and the relationships that that was able to bring us uh, with DCP Midstream and Worley have been really fundamental to our growth in the US marketplace. And we really appreciate the time and being able to share our business and our vision with you today. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. All righty. So for our next second to last startup, we have Joachim from Amp Control. He's coming to us from New York. So let's all give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Joachim. <laughs> Hey, thanks a lot. Um, I'm Joachim, founder and CEO of Amp Control. Um, before founding Amp Control, I was working as an um, energy consultant for PwC. Um, means I was working with utilities, uh, good operators, on optimizing processes and helping them uh, um, developing new products. I also worked with Siemens and Daimler uh, in engineering sales. With us on our team is Bela Patkai, who is uh, CTO. Uh, he has a PhD in artificial intelligence. He worked also as a postdoc uh, with, uh, at Cambridge. And the last 15 years, he has worked with OEMs, with car manufacturers, and in the aerospace industry um, on, uh, on, on product development. Also on our core team is Jonas, uh, who brings great experience uh, from his PhD in smart grids. He has specially focused on uh, integrating electric vehicles in, in smart grid solutions. And he also worked for uh, Volkswagen and for uh, other big companies. So at Amp Control, uh, we are um, helping companies to install more chargers at lower costs. So we provide the smart charging solutions uh, for charging point operators. So when I was working at PwC, I saw one big trend. Um, the number of electric vehicles are growing from 5 million to 105 million uh, vehicles in 2030. This is a great number, um, but we are facing also one other thing is the increasing number of charging stations. And we're also increasing from 1 million to 40 million charging stations by 2030. Also a great number, but what does it mean for us? Well, for those who install it, it means that these charging stations are very costly and slow to install them and in the operation. This is mainly driven by, uh, by three pain points. The first one is, um, 
it is extremely capital intensive to install these chargers. Means you have to, besides the charger itself, you have to put in transformers, grid lines to actually provide the power to your chargers. The next point is the amount of costs. So besides after the installation, you have to actually pay utilities, of course, to provide the power. And we're not talking about the, the kilowatt hours, we're talking about the KW, the peak power demand uh, of your 50, 100 chargers on your site. And last but not least, it's a waiting time until you can actually use the chargers. You can still install your chargers within uh, three weeks or, or two months, it doesn't matter. You have to wait until you get the power from utilities. So after they did the, the construction, they need to approve it, and then you can go. And this can take up to 12 months. To summarize this up, um, these costs are often three to five times higher than the actual charging station. So what we found, I found out at M Control is we can actually optimize them. Looking at what is regular charging, we start charging directly with the highest power on the charger. There's nothing else we consider. Optimized charging can, be, can mean we take in consideration when is the EV driver actually leaving the charging station and then reduce according to that the power of a charging station. So we have analyzed 90,000 charging events to identify um, how many can actually be, can actually be uh, optimized. And the outcome was 50% can be optimized of these 90,000 real charging events of our customers. So AMP Control is running AI-based optimization to, incre to increase the number of charging stations in a shorter time and to re reduce CapEx and OpEx. Means we take the data from the charging stations and from the fleet and then send commands to the charging stations uh, specifically for each charging event. Each event takes around one second to calculate it um, as once, once the user connects his vehicle. Today we're doing this with one of the biggest customers. Uh, it has to be. Uh, it has to be is one of the leading op uh, operators in Europe. He has 18,000 chargers in 16 countries. They're picking us because we have a seamless integration uh, where we can implement everything within two to three weeks instead of taking years or a month of development or getting a smart grid solution to integrate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All righty. It's a moment we've all been waiting for. I'm going to make you all do a drum roll. No, I won't do that. Okay. This is Juan from ADEX, so let's put our hands together or drum roll. <laughs> Hello, I'm Juan Gomez, BDN of ADEX, and today I'm going to talk to you about the artificial intelligence for thermal power plants. We are a clean tech company headquartered in Spain and the US, and we support the energy transition by helping thermal power plants to be more flexible, more efficient, and cleaner. So they can be more dispatchable and leave room for the renewables in the mix. And we do it by using a kind of inter artificial intelligence. I'll give some details on the power generation market in the US. The, re the reality today is that, is, mo is that more than 60% of the en energy produced in the US comes from a thermal power plant. And looking at the trend, it looks that it will take a lot of time to get rid of them. So at least let, the, let it make, make them more efficient. In the energy market, there is also an overcapacity. The power plant load factors are very low. And there is also a prioritization of the intermittent renewables. And the energy prices are very dynamic, changing every hour. So this is the new contest for the thermal power plants the energy imbalance market for them to, load, to change load constantly and being compliant with lower emission levels. If these thermal power plants are not flexible or dynamic enough, they are not dispatched. So they put in risk their PNLs. What do we do in ADEX to help these power plants? We increase the ramping rates, decrease the minimum load points, improve the heat rates, reduce thermal stress and thermal fatigue, and all of this while being compliant with emission levels. I'll show you an example of the capacities of our technology. 
Here in, in the green line, you can see the superheated steam temperature of a combined cycle gas turbine power plant. In the black line, you have the load with ups and downs that produces uh, peaks and drops in the steam temperature. Now, in this power plant, we switch on our system, Alex. And this happens. With the same profile of the load, we have the steam temperature 100% of the time within a 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit band. And how do we do, do we do it? Well, every power plant in the market has an advanced process control system. These are from different vendors, but all, all of them use different technologies, but have something in common. PID controllers to interface with the actuators of the plant. We have developed a self-tuning AI controller, and on top of it, a software ledger that works as an add-on to the existing control system. This patented technology, in the form of a self-tuning AI platform, does not require any big data or machine learning system, and the payback is really short for our customers. By the way, we are ADEX. Our slogan is we, are the extra, we add the extra mile on industrial performance. Here are some of our customers in Europe, Enel, or here in the US, Arlike or Pacific Corp. Thank you very much. All right. I want to say a big thank you for all the startups and the corporates who took their time, energy, and resources to come out here today, also risking your lives. I appreciate it. And as an ill-fated joke afterwards, we will only serve Coronas. No, I'm kidding. OK, well, thank you so much to everyone. And here's Wade again, our program director, for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Noreen. Uh, once again, congratulations to all the startup companies who presented today. Um, as mentioned before, we know that for the startups who weren't able to make it today uh, due to coronavirus concerns, we're taking required actions to uh, put them through this uh, screening process with our partners and we'll uh, get in touch with them to uh, present virtually at, at, at some point later. And then we'll tally all the votes and announce the startups who make it to the program, hopefully soon. Um, you know, as, as the nature of the selection day, by the way, the, the selection day events for IoT mobility uh, programs, as I mentioned earlier, have all turned into virtual. So uh, the partners uh, today and, and the guests will be able to receive a link so they can view the startup pitches remotely. So uh, that's uh, as, as for activities that plug and plays are concerned, as I mentioned also, there were some off-site meetings and some dinners and receptions that were planned on the other days and they all have canceled. So apologies for that and hopefully in future we'll have some more uh, meaningful face-to-face -face interactions with the other parties involved. So uh, I would like to, uh, before we wrap up, uh, love to turn it over to our guests. Uh, the startups have uh, usually asked us to, you know, understand what's the demographic of the partners that are involved in the program and perhaps uh, give them like a one-liner introduction of what your company is focused on and, you know, what are some of your focus areas. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it around before we conclude the session today to our partners to say a few words. Uh, I know we've done this uh, round of introduction in our board meeting earlier today, but since the startups are here, so I'm gonna quickly pass it around for the partners to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Junji Junji Yoshida with Osaka Gas, which is a Japanese gas and electricity utility. I'm Jaime Tolle from, from Claro Colombia, cellular operator. Hi, I'm Andres Felipe Zuluaga from Claro Colombia too. I'm in charge of the innovation team. Thank you. Hi, I'm Watanabe, uh, Chioda Corporation based in uh, Houston. Um, I'm looking for the development partners for the digital products. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sabod Gupta, joined by Thomas Allman uh, from Valo Ventures. We're an early stage venture capital fund based in Palo Alto. Thank you, welcome. Hey, 
Yeah, Brian Walsh here. I head up uh, a new group called Wind Ventures. Our corporate sponsor is Copec, which is, I think, gas stations, convenience stores, and B2B energy services throughout Latin America. So beyond capital, we offer uh, unfair access to Latin American growth markets. Uh, Andy from Contact Energy in New Zealand. We're looking at uh, technologies to help our customers transition to a low carbon future. JC Chambers, DCP Midstream, we operate about 62,000 miles of gas pipeline throughout the US. So thank you very much to everyone who came out and enjoyed speaking with you later. Hi, Frederick Tuck from uh, Copenhagen, Mersk Drilling, uh, Head of uh, Innovation Scouting. Um, Fernanda from Gerdau. We are steel manufacturing, one of the biggest ones in Latin America. Hello, Owen Teach with uh, Blue Bear Capital, an early stage VC investor in energy. Hi, I'm Cindy Chen with Brookfield Asset Management's growth and technology investing team. So looking at companies across infrastructure, renewable, uh, and property. Hi, uh, my name is He. Uh, I work for SK. Uh, it's the second largest conglomerate in Korea. We are looking into various fields of uh, investment opportunities, but my personal uh, uh, interest areas are energy, construction, prop, and bioscience. Hi, my name is Vito Big. I'm with SNC Electric. We are a manufacturer of uh, switching and protection uh, gear for the electric power distribution, and I'm looking for new technologies. Matt Byrne here uh, with Technip FMC, an oil and gas service company. Hi, my name is Daisuke Nishimura. Uh, I work with a company called Makanika, which is a solution provider focused on the, some of the in industrial spaces based out of uh, Japan. Hi, I'm Lisa Larson. I'm from Park Hill in Palo Alto, and I'm here looking for new technologies in buildings control and energy efficiency. Hi everyone, um, Yuji from Kajima. Um, we're a general contractor doing a uh, wide spectrum of construction. I'm very excited to uh, talk with you everyone and we're looking for something out of construction as well. So very much uh, excited, thanks. Hello, I'm Roy Ishikawa from Energy Case Park Park. Uh, Energy Case Park Park. Uh, we are uh, automotive related uh, part manufacturer, but uh, currently we focus on uh, renewable energy technology. Uh, Ray Martinez with the uh, Fortis and uh, UNS Energy, uh, North American Electric and Gas, uh, North American and the Caribbean and um, just the uh, principle for emerging technologies and innovations, looking at different products and uh, solutions out there, so. Hi, I'm Yoshi uh, from Asai Kasei Corporate Venture Capitals. Uh, I'm researching the industry IoT technologies. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, again, by concluding this session, I do also want to recognize some of our partners who we're planning to be out here uh, for today's session. Uh, our partners at, at Tokyo Gas, Chevron, ExxonMobil, um, and, and a few others who participated virtually today. Um, you know, your information will be shared with them uh, to those anchor partners who are looking to participate in the selection process. Thank you so much. Networking session will be uh, out there. Uh, we're out. We're going to be up here till five o'clock, so we'll have plenty of time for networking and, and you know, making face-to-face -face interaction with entrepreneurs. Please uh, give them a round of applause for their presentation.